Our next speaker is the food editor at grist.org. He has con contributed to magazines such as Harper's, New York, and Conservation, and to National Public Radio and This American Life. His first book is called All Natural. Please welcome to the stage, Nathaniel Johnson. Thank you so much for having me out here. This is an amazing event. I feel like I've found my people all clustered in one place. Um, so Grist, for those who don't know, it's, it's a nonprofit news site, and we cover the environment, so urbanism, farming, poverty, climate change, general destruction, but funny. Um, you know, doom and gloom with a sense of humor is our tagline. Um, and it's not doom and gloom for the sake of depressing people. The whole point is to find real solutions that are actually possible and make a difference. Um, so this is a picture of our world trying to feed its uh, children. We've, invi we've invited four billion people to dinner. They didn't ask to be invited, but we have summoned them. And when they get here, we have a duty to feed them. Um, we also have to do it without taking up any more space if we want to be environmentally responsible. Um, and also while eliminating greenhouse gas production. So this is a challenge. Um, and before I get started on this challenge, I just wanted to um, give you a guide to how to be skeptical about me. Um, I'm something of a professional skeptic, so I, I welcome your keen minds and tough questions uh, to call me on my shit. Um, and I will be around all weekend if you want to talk, have questions from this talk, um, or have, have things for me to think about. Um, so I basically, this is me and my, my dad at the top of Yosemite Falls. Um, I came from this very hippie, all-natural uh, family, and we would spend these magical summers in Yosemite, and the farther we got from people, the more beautiful it would get. Um, and then we'd go back to civilization and things would just get uglier and uglier. And so I, I grew up with this sense that um, humans ruin things. And uh, this, this idea that what's natural is good and healthy um, is really tenderly wedded to my sense of childhood innocence. Um, so this is a, a little bit older with me and my bro, Cathedral Peak. Um, so I come from this place of trusting nature more than civilization and, and technology. Um, but growing up in this way also gave me a front row seat to see all the ways in which this kind of ideology fails catastrophically as well. Um, and so I, I started writing about these things as, as a journalist. Um, and my, my first book uh, really looks at these, at these questions as it comes to um, personal health and, and environmental health. Um, and when I started to write the intro to All Natural, this book, uh, what I wanted to say was that it seems like the world is getting better all the time, but there's, you know, we have these cool toys and technologies, um, but there's a lot of ways in which we're less healthy and less free and poorer as a species. Um, so I went out to try and find the data to support my priors, um, and I just, I, you know, I could have cherry-picked, but the, all of the um, studies I was reading were pointing in the other directions. Um, and so this book ended up being not an argument in one direction or another, but sort of a close look at the ways in which this issue is, you know, which this ideology is true or not true in these different areas. Um, and I think at this point, my sort of my assumption has shifted to the to the other side, you know, where I um, have this assumption that technology is generally good, um, and of course, you know, I, I'm questioning my questioning in, in this eternal recursive fugue state. Um, <laughs> so um, I picked this topic pretty impulsively, and first thought I thought, whatever, you know, it may not be the sexiest thing ever, but it's important, and I've been thinking about it a lot, um, and so. I just want to talk about feeding the world. Um, but the more I thought about it, uh, you know, the reason that I'm interested in this is because um, it's one of the things that more people than almost anything else 
are wrong about. Um, it's, this, it's this wonderful opportunity. You know, people are floridly wrong about lots of things, but this is something that most people don't know they're wrong about yet. Um, and there's this, this base layer of assumptions um, that's really widespread and unquestioned, at least in my little tribe of coastal liberals and media workers. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm really excited to, if, if any of this is new to any of you, um, to perhaps give you the tools to start asking the right questions. And um, my hope is that um, you'll become candles in the, in the darkness of wrongness. Um, so I figured I should mention, you know, I mentioned that people are getting things wrong. I should just talk briefly about some of the big stum stumbling blocks. Um, and each one of these could be a talk into itself, so I don't want to get bogged down here, but, you know, again, I will be all around all weekend. Um, this, the assumption that big industrial farming is evil, and small is good. Um, and what I found is that there's really good and bad everywhere. There's good small farmers and bad small farmers. There's, there's some really wonderfully uh, efficient and, and ecologically aware big farmers. And well, there's no clear dividing line. What, what does industrial really mean? What does, where is small and where does big begin? Um, this idea that chemicals in general are bad, you know, um, synthetic fertilizer. The issue with synthetic fertilizer is um, yes, it, it can have a, if used in the wrong way, a very local uh, negative effect on the soil, but we're talking about exactly the same chemicals uh, as in other non-synthetic fertilizers. And it's not the syntheticness that's the problem, it's the fact that it's often not combined with the other elements that the soil microorganisms need to eat. And so you're putting an intense uh, food source for one particular type of um, growth and not others. Um, uh, pesticides, you know, all farmers have to use some form of pesticide, and sometimes it's, it's better to use a tiny bit of a really e effective synthetic pesticide than a, a less effective um, organically approved pesticide. Um, and this idea that we can farm in harmony with nature, um, you know, nature abhors a farm in general. You, you have to push nature to some extent in order to get it to grow you food. Um, and I just found, as I was, as I was reporting on agriculture, I found more, all these people who, who work in farming get pretty annoyed when you tell them that they just need to shift to a different paradigm and it can solve all their problems. And it's not because they were stubborn or ignorant, it's just the opposite. It's because they've been trying and refining lots of different methods for years and trying all of these things. Um, so when I would come up to them and say, well, just cultivate habitat for predatory insects rather than using insecticide, they'd be like, yeah, we've, we've been doing that for 10 years, you know, when conditions call for it, and here's when it works and here's when it doesn't. Um, so so um, there are many complexities and, and contradictions here. Um, so why is agriculture such fertile ground for myths? Um, well, using medicine as an analogy is, is useful here. When you make a medical decision, it's really useful to be skeptical about it. Um, it's right there, it's your body, it's personal and palpable. Um, whereas agriculture, your, your, the food is personal, but the actual growing of the food is far away and abstract. Um, patients have to weigh the trade-offs. Um, Eaters don't personally have to wait off trade-offs. They can say pesticides are bad. They don't have to see, okay, what, what's the other solution? But as a patient, you, can, you, can, you can't do that, right? You can say, yeah, chemotherapy is bad, but then you have to say, okay, yes, what's the alternative to chemotherapy? Um, and for, in medicine, it's life and death. There's a high incentive to learn and to question assumptions. And for eaters, there's really very little incentive to question. Um, you know, we get the food, it's, it's there, uh, and we move on with our lives. Um, and I think that there's a lot of journalists um, who, you know, my peers, my friends, who are insufficiently skeptical. A, a lot of journalists, um, 
will get stories from activist groups and have close relationships with activist groups, um, but don't like calling up uh, the local agricultural college and getting an expert to walk them through the body of science. So, um, so it's not that they're like afraid to call up the evil um, corporate agribusiness, um, but they're afraid even to call up the, the scientists. Um, public scientists at land-grant colleges are often seen as um, blinded or stuck in their paradigm. Um, so if, if we were to bring back the medical analogy, it would be kind of like um, journalists getting stories from homeopaths but hesitant to call up Johns Hopkins because they're all influenced and bought off by big pharma. And this, you know, I want to be clear here, um, you know, I, I, I think that all Alternative medicine is, is useful, it's important in uh, utilizing placebos and working with patients um, to get at and address psychological and social causes of disease, but there's also a lot of crap. Um, and uh, the same is true, I think, with the organic movement. It's, it brings important attention to holism, to ecological determinants of soil health that we really need to learn from, but there's also a lot of marketing BS. Um, in, and it's true that there are scientists, um, as, as there are doctors influenced by big farmer, pharma, you know, there are ag scientists influenced by big ag, and there's a clear incentive for these big companies to try and push the public discussion and the politics. Um, so let's remain skeptical on the science, but let's not simply dismiss and pretend that every one of these experts is stupid or a shill. Um, most of these scientists are wonderful, open-minded public servants. So in terms of the media, um, there's, there's also a problem with um, reporting the, the, these stories about how our food is made. Um, when we journalists pick stories, this is what drives us. Uh, we want respect and we want attention. And so the respect side of things is our, our mandate to comfort the afflicted, to afflict the comfortable, and to, to break news, to bring you the facts. Um, and that's how we get respect from our peers and feel good about ourselves. Um, but we also want attention. We want stories that go viral and everybody reads, and that comes from celebrity news and scandal and, and political horse races. Um, and what you really want is to find this middle ground um, where, where you get both. Uh, so, that, that, that ideal story is something that reveals, that is, it breaks news, um, that a powerful person or organization, the comfortable, has been taking advantage of those with less power, uh, the afflicted, and this creates scandal. Bonus points if you can embarrass a celebrity or politician in the process. This provokes outrage, leading to attention, but is perceived as honorable, so it earns respect. So this is the great, the great story for a journalist. And so there's a high incentive for us to do stories about how big evil companies are poisoning you with your food. Um, and these, I'm not saying these are, stories are bad. I think there's, there are many of these stories that are wonderful. Um, but there's very little incentive to do, for journalists to do stories about uh, what big ag is doing that is right and useful. Um, okay, so this is a lot of preamble um, down to the brass tacks. How do we feed ourselves without wrecking everything? Um, to start off, so I spent about six months reviewing the research on this, and we boiled it down to this uh, two and a half minute video. So we'll start off with that. When we talk about eating the world, we're really talking about mandating poverty. We already know about food, we just don't share it with people who risk it more than they can ever eat. So governments have to step up to build social safety and educate their people. At the same time, most poor people around the world are farmers. And it turns out that one of the best ways to decrease poverty is to increase farm yields. As one economist put it, no country has achieved mass dollar poverty reduction without prior investment in agriculture. To see what this looks like in real life, meet Birke Van Dagenshi. Oxfam female food hero of the year in 2013. She's a single mom who got married at 14. She owns a farm four hours away from the closest town. More than anything else, she wants her children and her grandchildren to be better off than her. That would be nearly impossible if they stayed on the farm. The farm doesn't produce enough to provide a respectable salary, 
and there's no room to expand unless they push it up a slope of an ecologically sensitive mountain. So instead of getting bigger, she needs to increase her yields. On average, African farmers get tiny grain yields, the same amount that European farmers were getting at the time of Caesar. Birkikan uses both agroecological techniques, like polyculture for growing squash under orange trees, and also conventional farm technology to improve her yields. She made enough money to send her children to school, and now her eldest son has a degree in civil engineering. We just have to replicate this success a billion times. Easy. Oh, one more thing. Ultimately, the biggest issue with feeding the world is that the population keeps growing. But actually, Virtikan's story also holds the solution to that problem. The real cause of population growth is insecurity. When children die and women are repressed, population booms. When children thrive and women are empowered, population growth stops. Supporting the Virtikans of the world with the best tools so they can increase their farm income is key to creating a peaceful, stable, and well-fed world. And if you want to learn more, Check out my recording here. So that was uh, Daniel Penner and Amelia Bates, the video and, uh, and art artists who uh, are responsible for that at Grist. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit more deeply. Let's start with population. Right now we're in the middle of this crazy experiment. Um, we've all seen graphs of world population growth but you may not have seen one that shows the entire history of our species. And that's, looking at that is really kind of scary. And I, um, I wanted to grab one of these and my, the internet was down, um, but luckily it's a relatively easy one to draw. So I just made it. Um, and this is, this is literally what it, what it looks like, you know, if you actually were doing a scientifically correct um, scale. Um, it, this seems like a normal day to all of us. It, we're living these reasonable, modest lives here, but in reality, we're plastered to the nose cone of this population rocket that's powering up into the stratosphere. This is alarming, but it's also really exciting. You know, rockets are cool. I'd take a chance to take a rocket into space, even though it's risky. And uh, this population rocket, we don't know if we're gonna be able to control it, but we get to be the ones who try. Um, and having all these people makes the world a really wonderful, innovative, dynamic place. Um, so how do we control population? Well, we have a very stark choice. Um, dying off or development. Uh, mass starvation uh, is not ideal, I don't think any of us would say. Um, and it doesn't work very well, because as, as soon as the population falls, um, then we grow more food and it resurges. So it's not that we need a mass die-off, it's that we need repeated annual mass die-offs. Um, so as, as, as I said in the, in the video, um, there's really abundant evidence that as people, particularly women, become more prosperous, they end up having fewer babies. And this is why social justice is a green issue. Massive poverty reduction, I think, is a precondition to saving the world. Okay, so if we want to uh, allow better, help people to feed themselves better, um, how do we do it? How do we make sure that everybody gets a slice of the global pie? Well, there's three strategies here. Um, a bigger pie, smaller forks, and better table manners. Bigger pie means increasing production per acre. Smaller forks, um, eat less, eat less meat and waste less. Better table manners, um, divide things up more equitably. So we have these, these options and there's strong partisans for each of these things. Um, the experts that I found who were looking at this issue objectively as, and, and not trying to use it to, um, to support some other cause, we're really saying we need all three, um, to do all three if the Earth can support um, the number of people that we're bound to have. So let's look a little more closely at these. Uh, to, to make a bigger pie, um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Training people to farm better and giving people better access to technology. Um, farming better is 
is a, a great way, something I think that we need to do. But it's also really hard. You know, these, this one billion small farmers um, takes a lot of resources. They're in places that are hard to reach. And there's even been studies uh, where people suggest that the cost of having these highly trained expert um, extension agents, the, the trainers, um, going out to visit these people and try and win their trust and, and show them that they actually understand their unique soil type and climate uh, matrix, um, that all that money would be better spent elsewhere, perhaps. I, th I think that we're going to need that as well. Um, but we're probably also going to need better access to technology, um, better seeds, fertilizer, pest and disease control, irrigation, um, farm equipment, tractors, mechanization. So um, poor farmers employ traditional varieties of plants and crossbred livestock that produce really significantly lower yields than modern varieties. But there's also downsides here. The modern seeds and breeds are expensive. Um, and they move some control from the farmer to agribusiness. Um, the reliance on inputs like these require infrastructure. You've got to have roads to get this to them. Berta Can, the woman in the video, she has to walk, I think, 11 miles to the nearest road. These are a couple examples of each of these. On, on the left is a um, example of using polycropping, um, enriching the soil with uh, um, nitrogen producing trees. Um, and on the right is, uh, this is brown streak disease in cassava, which is a really big problem um, in Africa. It's spread by flies and um, farmers end up spraying a lot of pesticide to kill the flies. There's a disease resistant version available, um, but it's GMO, and so it's, um, it's been tied up in the politics. Um, so both of these things also have problems. You know, the, the trees require the infrastructure to get them out. You have to deliver all of these saplings, and it takes a long time for the trees to get this big, and the farmer has to be buying into it and watering them um, through, through those five years or whatever. Um, and similar with the uh, cassava, you know, you have to get it to the farmers. You have to um, convince them that it's worthwhile and it's not going to kill them. Um, so we have this chicken and egg problem. We need, we need the stable governments and the infrastructure and the trainers um, in order to get this stuff. And at some sense, you need um, the productive farms in order to get the stable government and the money to pay for all of these things. Okay, so. Smaller forks. We can reduce food waste. We can eat less meat. Um, we can just eat less and be less fat. Um, and we can, there's, there's some interesting things to explore in terms of fish. So food waste is a really um, interesting one. This is showing uh, calories wasted per person. Uh, and the reason that the North American one is so high is basically because food is cheap here. You know, we've always had a problem of oversupply. Uh, and so it's easy to waste it. And if you look at places where uh, food is a lot less cheap, um, those people are wasting a lot less food. The green is the actual consumer, right? So that's where the, um, the food waste of the end user is happening. And if you look at the other colors, um, those are production, handling and storage, processing. And so if we want to reduce food waste there, um, that's something different than perhaps you think of immediately. That's helping farmers um, harvest more of their food. So that's things like um, pest control. That's things like um, food processing so that it doesn't go bad. That's infrastructure um, so that it can get to market. Um, so there's a lot of talk about food waste in terms of us um, not throwing as much away. But I'm not convinced that that would have an impact to the people in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. That's where the hungry people are, by, I, by and large. Believe me, I understand there are hungry people here, too. Um, and that's where the population is growing. So meat. It's really unlikely that everyone in the world is going to 
be able to eat as much meat as Americans eat right now. So it's just far more efficient to eat a plant-based diet than it is to feed those plants to animals and then eat their meat. This is just basic physics. You lose some energy in, in the trophic cascade. Um, meat is a really resource-intensive food. Um, it requires a lot of water. It requires a lot of land. Um, and it produces greenhouse gases. And so should we stop eating meat? Well, easier said than done. I mean, I don't think it's really, I myself have not found a way to, to morally justify meat eating, and yet I still do it. 70% um, of Americans who become vegetarians go back to eating meat. The, the Dalai Lama, for God's sake, eats meat twice a week. <laughs> um, and the trend is toward, not toward less, but toward more. Um, and also, small farmers really need animals. Uh, they depend on grazers, on cattle, and other ruminants to farm the land that's, that's marginal for crops, but the animals can graze. And they depend on the manure from their fertilizer. Um, so at this point, if we're going to have sustainable agriculture, it, I, I think it's not possible to have it without some meat production. That could change. Uh, as, as the world becomes more prosperous and we get cool new things like the, have you seen this, the Impossible Burger? Um, so this is vegetables complete with um, plant blood that you, know, you bite into it and it drips this like hemoglobin rich thing that they've engineered. Um, there's these, this vat meat that is, you know, there's a million startups in San Francisco where I'm from that are trying to do this sort of thing with synthetic biology and plant proteins and all sorts of things. Um, and, there's, and there's people working on making vegetarian foods more compelling. Um, so, so these are interesting things, but still, still like big questions at this point, not actually changing the world. Um, so obesity. It, we just can't leave this out while talking about overconsumption. I think it's, um, it will, Obviously, consuming too much has direct consequences, but no one's really figured out how to fix this. And um, a lot of the attention in the media tends to be about what's the right diet or something, but it seems to me that, that really the fix is going to be political rather than technical solutions. You know, the pe people most prone to obesity are people with low incomes. Um, and, uh, you know, the solution here is likely to be more about... Um, equity than about um, the paleo diet. Okay, so fish. Um, you tend to hear lots of news about fisheries collapsing. Um, this is a chart of, of what fisheries have been doing. Um, and if you look at the blue, you know, this is actually, I think, a, a positive story. If you look at 1980 on, it's really leveled off. Um, and, this, and there are a lot of um, fisheries, there are fisheries that are uh, collapsing, um, but there's a lot of fisheries now that are well managed and have a sustainable harvest. Um, and, and we're seeing this steady sailing. That said, we're not getting more from them. Um, we're, we're currently fishing at close to the maximum. And so the, the yellow there is aquaculture which is going up and, and I think is a really wonderfully positive um, thing. You've probably heard stories about aquaculture being terrible and those stories are true and they've, it's just gotten a lot better. Um, you know, go update, look at what um, the Scandinavians are doing um, and, and uh, look at what on land aquaculture is doing. Um, Fish, if you want to create animal protein, they're just wonderfully efficient because they don't need to fight gravity. They don't stand up. They're not, and all of that energy just goes into uh, meat production instead. Just floating there, creating your dinner. <laughs> okay, so better table manners. I mean, I think this is sort of the, probably the most important um, strategy, but also the one that I have the least to say about. Um, if we could solve perfectly, all of our problems would be solved. Um, but we have never figured out how to solve, uh, how, to, how to share, right? Um, 
and, and we're not likely to start. The way that we do share is through governance, through health care, welfare, um, taxes, uh, and um, it would help a lot if we, if we did more of that. Um, so, um, all in all, I think this is a really um, hopeful story. It, when I went out and started talking to the experts, you know, the people like David Tillman and Jonathan Foley, who have looked at this from a uh, holistic perspective, they think that we can do it, you know, that we can freeze our footprint for agriculture, not put any more land into production, um, feed all the people that are coming, um, and, and live a more beautiful, delicious, prosperous life by wasting less, sharing more, increasing farm production, all in the purpose, service of uh, reducing and ending poverty and ultimately ending population growth. Um, you, you know, you might note that I haven't talked about the big controversies um, that you tend to hear. You know, it's not about GMOs or synthetic fertilizer or organic versus industrial. In short, it's not about anything that the food company marketers are obsessed with selling us. Um, these, these narratives are um, tangential at best. These things on this slide, they're all tools. And like any tool, they can be used for good or for bad. Um, I think that we'll have an easier time of it if we make use of these tools in a good way. Um, some are more important than others. Uh, I think we probably could get by without GMOs, but billions of people are made of synthetic nitrogen at this point. And we'd almost certainly see starvation or at least very massive land clearance um, if we got rid of synthetic nitrogen entirely. Um, so all of this is, uh, I've written a lot about this at grist, grist.org, or Google Hungry Hungry Humans um, for the, this series. Um, and so I invite you to, to go check that out. The references are in links there. Um, read them. Uh, see, if you, see if you agree with my assessment of the science. Um, be skeptical. I welcome that. Um, and uh, I have two, I just mentioned that I, I have two very special copies of my book. Very special in that I just have two, that's all. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll be walking around. If, if, you, uh, if you want one of those, um, come tap on my shoulder and we will haggle. Uh, um, oh, and I'm not supposed to take questions, um, but, um, but I, again, I'll be here for the entirety of the conference, and um, this is how to find me, and I respond to these. Um, mostly, you know, I can't, I can't get into long disquisitions on the internet, but I'll be here. Um, so look forward to talking to more of you about this, and again, thank you so much for having me out and giving me your ears.